Hello, how are you? Yes, sir, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for taking the time today. I totally binged the entire series yesterday. I loved it. It was really great. But um, I really want to know, so Duke was like a little bit of a reoccurring character in Troll Hunters and Three Below. Mm -hmm. But how did you feel about him being like the main character for I mean, I was, I was, I was <laughs> you know, uh, um, I kind of known when I first started on Troll Hunters that, you know, he'd be quite a big character uh, in Wizards. So that was all, always there. And I love, you know, looking back on it, I think that the introduction of Duxie was really, you know, it was great the way that he was only in a couple of scenes here or there, or, you know, and uh, people were just wondering who, you know, who is this guy? What, like, what is, what is he about? And then for wizards, then you, you see the whole history of, of, of who he is and why he's there and all that kind of stuff. And I just think, it, it, you know, it was a really good way to introduce this character. Yeah, I thought it was great too. I loved it. Hello. How are you? Doing good, thank you. So I'd like to know if there's any aspect of your character that you can actually relate to. That I can relate to. Uh -huh. um, uh, yeah, well, du Duxie's big into the guitar and that's kind of my, uh, my passion is the guitar and, you know, um, I collect kind of stuff. So uh, it, it, we're very similar like that. Obviously, I'm not like a 900 year old wizard. Uh, it still looks like a well, you look great. <laughs> you know, well, thanks very much. I definitely don't look like I'm 19, but uh, yeah, he's, um, well, I guess he's sort of, you know, determined, a little bit headstrong, uh, passionate, uh, empathetic, I guess. And I'd like to think that I'm probably all of those things. Great. Thank you. Hey, Colin. How are you? Uh, good, thanks so much for, for talking to us. I'm wearing my Duke inspired necklace today yeah. <laughs> and I really enjoyed the show. I'm, I'm curious there at the end and hopefully this isn't too big of a spoiler but you know there's a scene between Duxie and Merlin where you know he tells you you know what a wizard you've become and mm -hmm. it's so interesting throughout the series and throughout centuries you see their relationship evolve and I was just curious if you had any kind of perspective on what Merlin's relationship to him you know meant to Duxie and why it was so important for him to kind of get his acceptance and approval. Yeah I mean it was you know when I was recording that's you know stuff it was actually quite emotional because you know like that Merlin uh, was a father figure to Duxie you know and Duxie was constantly just trying to prove himself to Merlin to show that he was a good wizard to show and he kept getting fobbed off um, and then so for, for Merlin to turn around and, and say that to him and accept him as a powerful wizard and an equal is such a massive, such a massive thing for Duke. and quite an emotional uh, scene and an emotional thing to play. For sure, yeah, that I thought was one of the most emotional scenes. I actually got tears in my eyes, so I really, really enjoyed Yay. that. Part. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, hi guys, and hi Colin, hi Mark. Hi, um, how you doing? Hi, great. Hi. So I was able to binge a lot of the episodes yesterday. And one thing that I noticed was, I think a lot of times when there's an animated series, the quality is not cool. No, not what you expect from something you would see on the big screen. Wizards looks like it could be a feature film. And I was just wondering about the process of the changes in the animation from the first series and how that's progressed. Wait. Uh, you know, it's interesting because we basically have been working with uh, the same vendors, uh, the same three animation houses that uh, started with the very first episode, Troll Hunters. Um, and I think you've seen, as I've seen, an incredible, um, you know, evolution uh, and growth uh, in the animation. If you look back to the first episode of Troll Hunters, now you look to the, you know, first episode of Wizards, I think it's a massive, massive leap forward. And that's all, you know, it's really all thanks to the designers and artists and animators uh, that we've been working with. And the fact that we've really had the chance to work with many of them for the past nine years um, has allowed us to, you know, slowly iterate and evolve uh, the look of all the shows. Yeah, it looks amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone works really, really, there's a, a lot of hard work that goes into it. So that's really appreciated. Hi. Hi, Colin. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hey. Hi. Hey. How are you? I Love the background. 
Green screen, yeah, <laughs> little background. <laughs> so this is such a massive project and a finale to this trilogy. So I guess this is a question for both of you. What do you hope audiences will take away from this series after watching these last episodes? Colin? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think for, for Duxie, for somebody who's been spending, I guess, 900 years or whatever it is to try and, uh, you know, win Merlin's sort of affirmation and, and acceptance and all that kind of stuff, I think, you know, I hope that people will take, you know, some sort of idea of hope from it, you know what I mean? And uh, I think, uh, you know, for me, it was so much fun to get to play two different versions of Duxie in, in, in the show, which was uh, amazing. And hopefully people will, uh, like, I'm blown away by the animation and everything in it. So I think that it's it's an incredible, incredible show. So hopefully people will really love it. Uh, I'm hope, I hope people love it too. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that people are satisfied by the ending, but also surprised. Um, you know, I think, I think one of the things that makes this sh these shows special is we don't always, you know, zig where most people would zag. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the ending of Wizards is, uh, it's, it's, I think it's very, very different from what people are expecting. I wish I could talk more about it actually, but uh, it would spoil not just the show, but, but some, uh, some fun stuff that, uh, we ha we'll have to talk about later. Um, <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Hi, Colin. Hi, Mark. Hey. Um, so I actually watched this series with my family, and I have a five and an eight year old, and uh, they were immersed the whole time. Like, oh my gosh, you know, it's so different. And uh, Colin, this question is for you, and it's coming from my eight year old. Okay. And <laughs> he basically wanted to know what was your favorite scene to record during, you know, this whole time. <laughs> I really liked the uh, scene um, where I think it's the scene where Duxy comes across old Duxy, and uh, they sort of see each other for the first time and. Uh, any, any, to be honest with you, any of the stuff that, that had like young Duxy, the sort of bumbling idiot, uh, I absolutely, <laughs> absolutely love doing all of those. Uh, and I particularly love the line where I say, uh, I think it was, uh, bye bye me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they were any of those scenes with, with that young Duxy were great. Awesome. Thank you. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Thanks for joining me today. Um, so my question is for Mark or either of you, uh, you know, there, in episode five, there was a scene where Merlin uh, kind of put mask on Claire and uh, Duxie to, you know, silence them and everything. And usually, I mean, that would just be funny or whatever, but it struck a chord with me with everything going on in the world right now and the big debate on mask and things like that. And it just got me thinking, you know, uh, with everything going on, if there was anything that you would add or uh, change in the uh, in in the series, you know, what would it be? And uh, if you would, or, or what would it be? Would you change anything? And if so, what would it be? Um, hmm. that's a good question. <laughs> you know, not nothing springs to mind. Uh, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I, it's funny that, that uh, the sort of, you know, muzzle gag in episode yeah. five is odd, was oddly prescient. Um, and, uh, but of course, you know, none of us could have, could have seen this coming. Uh, no, I think, you know, I, I, it's funny. I'm not, as a writer, I don't typically look back on stuff and go, oh, I, I would have changed this for politics or I would have changed this for, to reflect current events. Um, mm -hmm. I, I will say there's, you know, I haven't been involved with anything in my career that I haven't wanted a, a, a do-over uh, in some way, shape, or form. But that's usually to address little little technical things like a, a line of dialogue I didn't feel like quite nailed, or you know, in live action, you know, a, a you know a production sequence that didn't have enough money going to it or something. Um, but you know, in terms of like uh, trying to sort of chase the zeitgeist. Uh, I, I, I tend to sort of, you know, I, t I, tend, I tend not to try because um, that, that way it could lie madness. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, you guys. Hi. Um, Hi. So I am a big proponent of family-friendly content. And, and so first of all, I just wanted to, to thank you for making a show that is family friendly and something I can watch with my kids. And it still has, you know, a little bit of an edge to it. Um, one of my favorite things um, about this show were some of the words that you made up for like, you know, like fuzz buckets and butt snack and things like that. So you can avoid the four letter words. So who came up with those? And do you have any uh, non four letter words you like to say? Yeah, great, great question. And thanks for asking, actually, because it gives me an opportunity to give a shout out to uh, Chad Quant and Aaron Walke, who are, are not only the showrunners of Wizards, but they've been uh, on the writing staff of Troll Hunters. And uh, during their time on Troll Hunters, I, I kind of discovered, along with the Hagman brothers, that Chad and Aaron had this gift for coming up with names, like naming stuff. Um, and, and not just, you know, to avoid, you know, standards and practices issues with language, but like they came up with the name of the arcane order, for example. They just they they have a real they have a lot of talents, but that's that's one of them. Um, and they they come up with a lot of the names um, that you hear on uh, the troll hunters and wizards. Great, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. I have um, Mark and Colin. I have a question for both of you. Mark, I wanted to know what do you think. What do you think sets Wizards apart or makes it different than Tales of Arcadia series? And did you always plan for Wizards to be the final chapter in the franchise? And Colin, I wanted to know what draws you to your character and what would you like audience goers to learn from your character? Colin, you wanna take it first? Um, okay, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I'd always wanted to do uh, uh, an animation uh, anyway and when this came up I was just uh, thrilled to be to be uh, a part of it and you know I, I think Duxy is so much fun in, to play in this season in particular with the two different versions with the older Duxy who I really love playing and uh, um, it's, just, it's just so much fun to, to sort of try and do a, a voice for animation you know you get to really ham it up which uh, I mean, I'm pretty hammy as an actor anyway, but I think uh, I think it adds adds a little something to it. So, uh, what do I hope people take away from it? I hope that people just really really enjoy it for the spectacle uh, that it is. I mean, it really is uh, fantastic and epic and uh, visually stunning. So, I just hope people really enjoy it and, and immerse themselves in it. Um. So as for your question to me, uh, you know, it's funny. I have this philosophy that when you spin off a show, the spinoffs should always have their own identity and always, you know, be unique and distinct. Otherwise, you're just cloning the original show. With Wizards, we, we had that challenge, but we also had an additional challenge, which is it wasn't just a spinoff. It was also the conclusion of a trilogy. So... Wizards kind of has to stand on its own feet as its own show, but at the same time, it has to feel like a satisfying end to a trilogy, which for my money is really sort of echoing the first chapter. Uh, I think, you know, to answer your question, like what sort of sets Wizards apart from the other two shows, um, I, I think, you know, for me, it, it kind of steals from and improves upon elements that uh, Troll Hunters and Three Below had. It, it sort of has the magic and the, the mythology of Troll Hunters with the heightened humor of Three Below. Um, at the same time, we're, you know, we're throwing time travel into the mix, and that's sort of like the, the new special ingredient that kind of makes this really, really different. Um, to answer the second part of your question, uh, did we always know Wizards would be the third and final uh, series in the trilogy? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, in fact, you know, we, we meet Duke C in the final season of uh, Troll Hunters, specifically knowing that he would be the main character of the third series in the trilogy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Mark. Hi. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Sorry I missed you before. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, you know, some of the characters go back in time and they pretty much immediately mess up the entire timeline, like within an episode. 
Um, and I'm curious if you guys could go back in time, what historical event would you want to witness and possibly change and mess up? Ooh, uh, I'd like to go. I would. I'd like to sing Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. Uh, That's good. Um, um, I wouldn't want to mess it up at all. <laughs> Uh, I would, I would want to have. Uh, I would, I would like to have something to do with uh, preventing Donald Trump from getting elected in 2016. Kind of <laughs> love that answer. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not shy about my politics. Good, I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Hello. So, Mark, I have a question for you. Um, you said that this series is really about going backwards to go forward. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, well, it, it's funny, I, I kind of, in many ways, sort of mean it literally, um, because, you know, in, in two respects. Uh, the first is this idea that, you know, we're ending this, this trilogy. It's, it's not just the end of Wizards, but the end of a three-show arc. Um, and we are literally going back in time to events that predate the first series. Um, so we're going backwards to end the show. Um, but there's also, a, I think, a slightly less literal uh, meaning to what I was saying, which is that I kind of, I favor trilogies that end not necessarily in a circle, but with a callback to the first chapter. You sort of like, you know, you, you've got the first chapter that sets the world and the universe and puts the characters and drama in motion. Then the second chapter uh, is usually like a really big departure from the first chapter and the third it kind of brings it all full circle and it, it sort of you know in, in musical terms it sort of symphonically recapitulates the opening notes uh of the symphony um and i i you know feel like that's kind of how we've structured the tales of arcadia uh, so go back a little bit to troll hunters in order to end the series thank you thank you Hey, Mark. I have a question for you. Um, working with Guillermo del Toro, I know he likes to slip in some Easter eggs here and there into his works. And as I was watching the first episode, I think I found a couple. And I was curious if you could confirm or deny uh, when Duke C is going into the GDT Arcane Bookstore, possibly the name of the bookstore, and maybe Guillermo del Toro's portrait above the fireplace. And... If I can keep going, <laughs> maybe a couple nods to um, Lovecraftian uh, mentions and the Haunted Mansion. So anything else that fans can look for like that? Because that was so fun. That, well, thanks for noticing all that, first of it's all. Great. Um, you know, and, and actually it's funny, like the GDT bookstore is itself an Easter egg. Because if you go back uh, to Three Below, the show that predates Wizards, uh, you'll actually see the GDT bookstore in the background in Arcadia. Um, so we were, we were sort of very intentionally planting that seed, uh, mm -hmm. knowing that we'd then go to see the inside of the store. Um, I'm trying to think if we'd worked out any other Easter eggs. Um, nothing springs to mind. You pretty much caught all the, you know, all the things <laughs> in the bookstore. Um, we will return to the bookstore later in the series. Um, so you'll, you'll get a second chance to to take a look. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I love spotting those little things. So thanks for pointing those out. No, thank you so much. Hi. Hi again. <laughs> so I guess my question can apply to both of you. So what is the biggest challenge that you faced in your roles, respectively, as director and actor? Oh? Uh, for me, it was I had never done an animation before. Uh, well, before I did the couple of scenes or whatever in Troll Hunters, and it was about it's it's a completely different way of of acting really it's uh you, you you know normally you try to be as subtle as you can uh on camera and stuff and you just you can't do that for for animation so that was a big learning for me was to realize that i could be as big as i i could possibly be and that's where the animators then animate to the heightened whatever style of, of uh, voice that, that you use. So uh, it was great fun. And then when you get into it, it's, it's, it's so much fun. Uh, yeah, I, it's funny, like, just, just to sort of, you know, follow on from that. I, one of the things that is so enjoyable about uh, working on this trilogy is the fact that uh, there's so many actors who had never done voice acting before. 
Um, and that, like, to, to sort of watch, uh, you know, you you and the other actors go through that creative evolution is, is always very, very satisfying. Um, you know, to answer your, your question, Eshin, um, you know, what's the most challenging thing? Um, I, I find, honestly, it, it kind of depends on each episode, but overall, you know, the, the challenge sort of I always feel the most acutely is I, I never want to let Guillermo del Toro down. Um, you know, he, he sets the bar really high and, and you don't, it's not like you're afraid of him yelling at you. It's actually his passion is so infectious um, that you, you really don't, you know, it's like, it's like playing for a coach and you don't want to let the coach down. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so Mark, I love that you have a background in comic books and that you were one of the authors on the graphic novel for Troll Hunters. So I'm just wondering, do we have more of that coming? Is there going to be a Wizards graphic novel on the way? No, unfortunately not. Uh, we, we pitched it to Dark Horse, which is the, the company that, um, you know, that DreamWorks has the uh, uh, publishing relationship with, and they published our troll hunters graphic novels and um for for reasons sort of known only to them they they uh they passed uh i was bummed because we we really wanted uh to do a comic book uh related to wizards the whole writing staff was actually on board with the idea and we had a whole bunch of of cool ideas because there was so much there was a lot of story that we didn't get a chance to tell in 10 episodes and uh characters we wanted to spend more time with um but, uh, you know, never say never, um, you know, it, it's, uh, this, this, you know, still chance, Dark Horse, you can change your mind anytime. Fingers crossed that happens. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Mark. Hey. Um, so I just wanted to ask, through the series, we kind of see the development of characters, and I felt like in Wizards there was, like, more in-depth um, just for relationships, uh, specifically with Arthur and Morgana. And so I just kind of wanted to know um, if the storyline was kind of written uh, with personal experiences that have happened, um, and kind of just how that developed. Yeah, I think, thank you, for, first of all, for, for your kind words. Um, you know, I, we, I know we spend a lot of time in the writer's room talking about just our own families and our own family dynamics. Um, you know, the, the Arthur Morgana relationship is, you know, it, you know we, we all have family and, you know, a lot of us have siblings and, you know, so there are times when those relationships are kind of, you know, fractured and frayed. Um, you know, the one thing that sort of really intrigued us was the idea that we wanted to kind of take the normal paradigm and flip it on its head, you know, so that Arthur is not entirely in the right, even though he's King Arthur and he wields Excalibur and he's, you know, uh, is seen in, in books and literature as, as you know, all knowing and, and just a hero. Um, we, we want to kind of, you know, present him as kind of having a prejudice, um, you know, against, you know, against magic. And it's, it's a prejudice that, that you know, he, he comes by somewhat, you know, honestly, in the sense that, you know, he blames magic for, you know, the death of his wife. Um, but at the, you know, sort of on the other side of the coin, we wanted to give Morgana uh, a real point of view so that she wasn't just a mustache twirling villain. Um, you know, that she, you know, there's a, she makes, I think, a better argument than, you know, than Arthur. And, and if we've done our job right, hopefully the audience spends the majority of wizards kind of going, you know, I, I kind of think Morgana, the bad guy, uh, was, was in the right here. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Hello again. Hey. <laughs> so Tanya, you know, touched on the, you know, the language, how it's a very kid friendly in the language. And, and listen, a fart joke in my house wins every single time. Like, they, you know, so I love the comedy in it. But you did mention, you know, it gets dark and it has death in it. And even the message is kind of, you know, the reper repercussions of our choices is kind of a powerful kind of message. So um, especially with, you know, with the safe programming we have today, why did you think adding these elements into this was so important? Well, you know, it's funny. I'm old. Um, I, I grew up on, you know, I grew up on Empire Strikes Back and, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And, you know, and 
I, I think I turned out okay. I wasn't, you know, emotionally crippled, you know, by Luke getting his hand chopped off. Uh, in fact, you know, it's funny, uh, the note that came back from Netflix when Morgana loses her hand is you can't mm -hmm. show the hand getting chopped off. And I'm like, why not? We showed it on screen, you know, back in 1980. Um, but, you know, I, I, so I come from the, the viewpoint that, you know, the kids can, they can handle a lot more in terms of tone than we give them credit for. Um, and, you know, I think the intention always was to, you know, produce a show, uh, really a series of shows that was, you know, for kids, but also for kids of all ages, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, people, you know, from, you know, from five to 500. Um, and I think if you're gonna, gonna do that, you've got to have some emotional complexity, you've got to have some, you know, tonal uh, ambitions. Um, and uh, I, I believe very strongly, and I think, you know, the, the reactions to Troll Hunters and Three Below sort of bear me out on this, is that, you know, kids can handle it, uh, you know, and, and enjoy it. Um, you know, they're not, they're not scared, they're not traumatized. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, you know, it, it seems to have worked out, knock on, knock on wood. I agree. Thanks. Thank you. Hi again. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I was watching um, the series, uh, one of my daughters was walking by and she, um, she said, uh, that sounds like Hook. And I'm like, it is. <laughs> and so um, my, my daughters are huge fans of Once Upon a Time. Um, mm -hmm. And I love that they can recognize your voice even in a different character. Um, so was there anything that specifically that you did for Dupsy um, when you were voicing him um, to change it from other recognizable characters? Uh, or, or how was that process for you? Uh, thanks very much, and uh, you can tell your daughters I said thanks very much. <laughs> I'm glad I will. <laughs> uh, uh, um, for for Duke Dukesy, I mean, I was kind of aware that I, you know, I didn't want him to sound exactly like I did as Hook, because obviously I've got an Irish accent, and uh, Hook was English, um, but uh, Hook's voice is a bit deeper. So with Dukesy, because he was a bit younger too, I wanted them to have a slightly higher pitch and. He's kind of more of a, more kind of a Londoner sort of, you know, it sounds like, it's kind of more like this, you know, it sounds like this, you know, so um, just to change it up a little bit. Uh, and, but um, yeah, no, he's, he, he was, it was more, I just really didn't want him to sound exactly like I did as Captain Hook. So I always, it's, it's always funny because people don't, a lot of people don't realize that I'm actually Irish. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, played, I played English so many, so many times, you know, but um, yeah, no, it was, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks. Hi again. So I wanted, I, I've got two questions. So I wanted to know, um, both of you, what were your favorite episodes and why? And then Colin, I want to know, how did that sourdough bread turn out? And did you really make it? <laughs> uh, I did make so I did make the sourdough bread, and I'm still making it. It turned out great. So, uh, and I'm using it for sourdough pizza bases as well. But, uh, <laughs> Fantastic. Um, my favorite episode. I just. Uh, I mean, I think it's so hard to pick because they're all so good. Uh, I really, really, uh, you know, I was blown away by the first episode. It just really, um, you know, my wife and. I've got two kids, my son is seven and, and my daughter's three and uh, we all watched it together and we all were just absolutely blown away by the scale of it, just how epic it is um, and just how beautiful, how beautiful it looks. So I think the, the first episode is, I would say is probably, favourite is the wrong term, but it definitely had a huge impact on me. Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. I, I love that first episode. Um, it, it, it just, it's funny. I remember uh, us a screening the first animatic for it uh, with Guillermo um, and we were all just blown away. And that was just when it was the storyboards. Um, so, you know, you can, I, I just have really enjoyed watching the evolution of, of that particular episode. Um, but, uh, the this the tenth episode, the final episode of the series, also has a special place in my heart because 
uh, of where we're able to get to emotionally. And uh, I don't want to sort of spoil the ending, but uh, there's, there's, there's certainly a scene between Duxie and Merlin that really tugs at your heartstrings. Uh, and, and anything that kind of can move me that way is, is always, uh, you know, among my favorite, you know, episodes. I was also Thank you. the first episode because it meant that I was still in it. I knew that Duxie uh, was still in it. He was still a good character. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. Hi again. Hello. Again. <laughs> Um, so Colin, we already talked a little bit about Duxie's arc and how he's just, I mean, this was an incredible season for him. I absolutely loved watching him learn about friendship and all that great stuff and actually becoming a really great wizard and having confidence in himself. Um, but so he's, he's gotten more into wizardry. He's confidence in himself with all his spells. So if you could have any of his spells, which one would it be and why? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I think I would like the, uh, I like the one where he, he, he sort of catches the, he reins in the shadow method, the sort of like, almost like a, like a whip. Uh, I could do with that to wrangle up my kids pretty much. Uh, <laughs> never we need to go somewhere. So I'll probably, I'll probably go with that one. That's a fun one. I think if I could have one, I would do that never ending hallway thing to just wear oh, my yeah. kids out. Just let them That's run it out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi. So Colin, I'd love to know why it was important for you to be a part of this project. Uh, I mean, when I first found out about it, I heard, heard about it for Troll Hunters. Um, I'd, I'd always wanted to do voice for an animation. It was like a childhood sort of dream. I was actually going to go uh, to study animation. I'd been accepted for wow. in university and uh, decided to become an actor instead. So I was- Thank you I, for that. No, thanks. Uh, I was thrilled to get the opportunity. And then, you know, like, you know, Guillermo del Toro, it's hard to not be excited by anything uh, that, that he's involved with as well. And just, I knew, I think, I, and Mark, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty certain that we sort of knew when I was coming on. Oh yeah, for sure. With the idea that, Wizards would be a oh, big, yeah. big thing for for Duxie. So, and um, so that was the fun of knowing that you know in Troll Hunters that might be in two or three scenes, I think it is, and then three below something similar. But teasing the character out that way, I just I, I love the idea of that. You know, knowing that this was going to be a bigger, a bigger season for him. Thank you. Hey Colin, I have a question for you. So working with fantasy series with obviously Wizards and Once Upon a Time, I'm curious, they both have such dedicated fan bases and coming into Wizards, did you know, you know anything about the fan base and did you have like a warm reception joining the show? And is fantasy a genre that you, you know, like to be participating in? I mean, fantasy is a genre that I've been participating in for nearly 10 years now so whether I, whether I want to be or not it's uh, it's uh, no I love I love fantasy uh, um, I, I knew I knew the original uh, first season of Troll Hunters so I knew about that but I didn't know that the fan base was as mm -hmm. rabid as it is and you know like similar to that the Once Upon a Time fans are you know incredibly rabid so uh, I was I was kind of half okay with it because I I'd got it was so so crazy on Once Upon a Time with the fans in a good way because that's what you want you want people to to really be passionate about your show or whatever um, so yeah it was kind of it was kind of interesting it'll be interesting to see also because Duxie was only such a smaller role mm -hmm. in the other ones and it was amazing to see like on my Twitter and stuff like that people sort of going why are you only doing like why are you only doing like a couple of scenes that's crazy <laughs> something going on there's something and obviously you can't say anything you know what i mean we couldn't say anything but it was sort of uh and also it was great that the character had a, had an impact for such a small amount of screen time you know in the first in in like the in troll hunters and stuff like that so yeah it was good fun yeah absolutely they're in for a treat this season then and get to see more about your character yeah thank you thank you Hi again. Um, okay, so Colin, I kind of wanted to talk about fans as well. I'm wondering which fans are the craziest? The Once Upon a Time, the, um, the Tales of Arcadia, or something else? Or something else? 
uh, I'll probably have to say the or something else because I don't uh. want people. people uh, crazy is not crazy is the, the wrong term. I think it's, it's passionate more. Right. I would say, um, and uh, I don't know. I've yet to see now for for wizards because, like I said, Duke C was only such a small character. I think that people didn't reg. You know, it didn't register so much. Uh, with the fans, but maybe after Wizards, it might be it might be a bit more they might be a bit more vocal to me about about things. Thank you. Hello, it's Ishan again. <laughs> Hello. So I have a question for uh, Colin this time. So, what was a typical day uh, shooting the series? Uh, any fun stories? Oh, working on this. Um, well, it was it's sort of it's a funny one because I. I live in Ireland, so I pretty much recorded most of my stuff here, uh, miles and miles, thousands of miles away from anybody else involved in the project. And it's, uh, you're, you're kind of in the booth on your own, um, sort of Skyping with people. Uh, so, but I, I weirdly, you know, I, I really, really enjoyed it because you just sort of, you get, you get to sort of go off in your own mind and you're not worried about people really sort of seeing you and watching you, whatever, performance-wise. So it was, um, it was a lot of fun. But it was, it, it, it's kind of weird being so far away from, from where everybody was and we'd have to try and arrange times that would suit where it wouldn't be the middle of the night for me and it'd be, you know, early morning for, for, the, for those guys in LA and whatever. But, uh, yeah, that was, kind of, that was kind of it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Colin. Um, my question is for you. And I was just curious because I know you're a dad. And so um, I was just curious because you are recording this stuff at home and everything. If mm -hmm. you have seen, uh, you know, the first two series with your kids and kind of like, what do they think of dad playing Dukesy, you know, and just being this character that's, you know, loved by so many? Um, well, yeah, my kids are quite young and, uh, I was saying earlier on when I played the, the first episode of Wizards for them, they, you know, I, I don't think that they, they kind of go, oh, yeah, that's you, dad. But then they're sucked into the, into the whole show and, and they, they forget about it. Um, so they kind of, but they, they loved it. Uh, and, you know, they're seven and three. And um, it's always, it's, I think it's fun to have, to do something where you know that I can watch it with the kids. Um, I mean, Once Upon a Time kind of was like, like that but it was more difficult watching something like that where I, I had to kiss somebody else and have your son when he was four say that's not mommy yeah oh so, uh so it's kind of nice to, to to have an animation to watch with them awesome thank you hello once again <laughs> so i was going to ask colin well duxie is a very interesting character i mean he's 900 years old right but He's a teenager and, and he pretty much, he acts like a teenager. You know, I mean, well, I'm in my forties and you would think I still act like a kid, but I would just hope by 900 years old, I would have matured a little bit. So, but I just want to know how you even approach a character to play a character like that or prepare. Uh, I mean, I had a bit of practice because uh, Captain Hook was similar. He was some sort of 700 years old mm -hmm. in once upon a time. So I guess, I guess I'd, had, I'd had practice. Um, he, uh, Interestingly about that uh, is because he is a teenager, essentially, uh, he acts like one. I really wanted when I played uh, past Duxie, for him to seem a lot younger. I wanted him to seem a lot more naive in, in, uh, vocally. So, and I, I, think it, I think it comes across. So you can kind of half hear a little bit more maturity in regular Duxie. Um, but yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know, you just have to imagine what it must be like to be a 900-year-old teenager. It'd be horrible. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Oh, thank you. Uh, so my question is, um, even though it was animation, like I was in love with all of the, I don't even know what to call it, the costuming of the characters. Um, and so I want to know if there's going to be Wizards merchandise or something, because Halloween is my favorite. Um, holiday and so I always dress up in October like every day and um, some of those costuming like I want to recreate. I, I think I think you asked a question that's above both of our pay grades. <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I know I know there's 
they they had a costume uh, for Jim Jim's armor. Um, I, I don't think they made it, in, you know, for adults. Uh, I think it was just just sort of kid sized costumes. But um, I don't know of any wizards related merch. Um, but that Mark, can you do something about that? Um, History has shown that I can't. Uh, <laughs> history has proven me very incapable of, of making these things happen. Um, but uh, it's definitely not for lack of trying or certainly not for lack of wanting to. All right, all right, I'll pre I appreciate it. Thanks. So I wanted to know, um, regarding the shows and Colin, when you were filming them or when you were voicing them at home, did the kids ever run in and want to help you voice? No, I was lucky. We got everything recorded in a professional studio before all this uh, COVID stuff kicked in. So I haven't had to. Uh, I've had to do ADR for for my my new show here, and so that's a very specific thing where you know we say, right, kids, you're not allowed in this part of the house. Stay away. Uh, I have to do it because Mike picks up anything. But um, luckily, we got everything done for Wizards before uh, before the lockdown kicked in. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi again. Hello. Um, I, this is a little spoilery, but it, so we end in a cliffhanger, like a real, I'm very angry. This can't be the end cliffhanger. Please tell me this can't be the end because it's a cliffhanger that I'm not going to say, but there's got to be more, right? You know, the, the way I like to answer this is, um, I can't, if I were to tell you, it would be the end of me. <sighs> um, uh, the, you know, DreamWorks and Netflix, they have a team of paid assassins on their payroll and, um, by, they're very good shots. Um, but, uh, you will not have to wait long to get an answer to your question. Okay. Yay. Thank you. So I pretty much binge watch this season in a day and a half or so. And as I was watching episode after episode, um, it got to be like halfway through the season and each episode was like finale worthy. There were tons of battles and character meetups and everything going on. And I would keep checking the episode list because I was like, is this the finale? Is this the finale? Did you guys know that this season was going to be this big or did you know as you were writing, did you just keep adding in scenes that just got bigger and bigger? You know, I, I think we really knew from the outset, mainly because we, we knew we only had 10 episodes and we, we had a sense of how much story we had to tell and it was more than 10 episodes worth. Um, so one of the biggest challenges was figuring out how to tell all the story that we wanted to tell in the screen time we had. And, and the way I sort of describe it is, is it's kind of like when you take a car and you put it in one of those compactors you end up with something that's a lot smaller than a car, but it still weighs as much as the original car. Uh, it didn't get any lighter. That, that's sort of how I feel about the narrative here. It's like we kind of took 20 episodes worth of story and compacted it into 10, so it feels like it's got the weight of 20 episodes. For sure. Yeah, it was a really fun you know, ending to the trilogy, um, but man, you guys just packed so much in. It was so much fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So for both of you, I'm wondering, well, did everything stay pretty close to the script or was there anything, any room for improvisation as you went along in production? Colin? Um, I think it was pretty much to the script. Uh, uh, if I remember rightly, I don't think there was much room for, you know, no, I don't, I, I don't think there was, was there, there might've been a couple of phrases here or there that were improvised on the day, but not many, I wouldn't think. No, it was pretty much to the script. Yeah, I would say generally speaking on the shows, you know, there's some, there are some actors who have done more improv than others, um, like uh, Jack Kenny and J.B. Smoove uh, in Three Below, for example, um, you know, but generally speaking, you know, there's not, there's not, it's, it's not that there's no room for improv. I don't think we would, you know, complain if, if anyone wanted to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, generally speaking, yeah, we, we just, it, for the most part, the shows tend to stick to the script. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So my question is for Mark. So 
Help me understand how you choose a film to executive produce. So what do you look for in a script or a story? And why did you decide to be involved with Wizards? Ooh, good question. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, for me, it, it usually is a mix of the people involved um, and the just whether or not the project sort of speaks to me. Um, you know, like in the case of, you know, the Troll Hunter franchise, I, I really wanted uh, to work with Guillermo del Toro. Um, but the material also really spoke to me. My, my sort of barometer is just like, if something sort of comes my way, um, I try to like sort of just, you know, live with it for a few days. And I find that if my brain is sort of, as my mind is wandering, you know, like if I'm in the car back when we used to do that and, you know, or in the shower or something, um, if my mind sort of wanders to the project and ideas start to come, that is usually how I know it's the right thing for me. Um, and uh, that's, you know, this was such a vibrant, you know, huge world that Guillermo created that uh, I just, it, it, it was like, a, you know, it felt like being in a playground. Thank you. Thank you. Hi again. Um, so Mark, this question is for you. Um, you know, in this series, we have a couple of new characters. Um, uh, you know, such as Archie and Callista and everything. And so I was kind of wondering um, when you guys kind of casted like Alfred Molina and, you know, uh, James Faulkner, um, were you guys um, kind of uh, making these characters with them in mind already? Or was this something that, you know, after the character was developed, you were like, we would like to cast, uh, you know, these people to voice these characters? Um, you know, over the, the life of the trilogy, both have been true. Um, you know, in in the case of like, you know, Alfred, I know that uh, Archie wasn't, you know, sort of created with him in mind, but he was our first choice uh, to voice the character. Um, and every time, you know, someone gets cast, uh, you go through a process of, of sort of adapting the voice of the character to the voice of the actor. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been very, very fortunate that, you know, I, I, I mean, gosh, with maybe like one or two exceptions, uh, over the life of the trilogy, uh, the, all the actors that we've cast were our first choices. Um, you know, and in some cases the characters were sort of created with an actor in mind. Uh, in other cases, it was like, okay, we created this character. Now let's, let's come up with a list of, of actors. Um, you know, but it's, it's always those, the, those two things are always, they're either, you know, overlapping or right next to each other. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. So touching on a little of Nicole's question, uh, she mentioned Callista and it was a very, you know, girl power character, right? And, and, uh, you had, um, Beatrice, which, who is like a strong female, you know, actress. So I just wanted you to touch on that, bringing the strong, these strong female characters into this series. Um, you know, I, I, it's funny. I, it's, it's something we've tried to do with, with all the shows, you know, um, in, in Troll Hunters, we obviously have Claire, um, in Three Below, Aja, um, you know, I think in, in the case of Callista, we were, we were actually trying to, to introduce a, you know, a strong female character, but in a way that was different from Aja and Claire. I think, you know, Aja and Claire, like, you know, Claire sort of has like sort of the traditional hero's journey, you know, sort of evolving with her powers and evolving with her responsibilities, you know, becoming a troll hunter. You know, Aja is someone who comes you know, from royalty, she, you know, she already sort of arrives on screen, very commanding, you know, very sort of take charge. Uh, with Callista, we, we want someone who, A, didn't, you know, didn't look like, you know, uh, Aja or, or uh, you know, uh, Aja or, or Claire, you know, want someone, you know, a little heftier, a little, little bigger bone, as it were, um, but also someone who had, you know, had been mis- uh, you know, underestimated her entire life, you know, who actually had much greater things in store for her than her initial appearance or past history. Thank you. Thank you.
So one of my favorite um, quotes in this series is, a wizard does not make mistakes, he makes unexpected possibilities. In both of your careers, what are some unexpected possibilities that you've made? Oh, uh, I mean, it's difficult as an actor to answer that because you, you, you saw at the, uh, the, you know, at the whim of directors or casting directors, sometimes, some, you know, sometimes you think you're appropriate for something and then you turn around and you're not. And then other times, you know, you, you have to make a decision whether or not to do it. But uh, I mean, I feel lucky to have done any, any of the work that I've done, like Once Upon a Time or, or this or, or, you know, the next show I have come out and just feel really blessed to have, uh, to have been a part of all of them. And um, it's such a different variety of, of shows, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if that's down to my choices or if it's just a bit of luck, to be honest. Um, you know, it's funny, my, my first job uh, in the entertainment industry was working on a show called The Practice, and it was created by David Kelly, who created Alan McBeal and Big Little Lies, and uh, I was a huge David Kelly fan, um, and uh, L.A. Law was like this seminal show, and this was like my dream gig, uh, and it was, it was every, you know, it, 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 more than everything I ever wanted to do as a writer, and uh, in, at the end of my first year on the show, I was you know, given an offer to go onto Law and Order. Um, and the offer was very enticing because it was an opportunity to, to write and produce more than I was able to do on the practice just because of the way David runs his shows. And I, if you had told me I would get my dream gig and then a year in I would quit, uh, I would have thought you were completely insane um, and, and talk about unexpected. But uh, I, I did leave the practice. I did join Law and Order and that's where I met my wife. Um, so it created this incredible unexpected possibility, uh, and, and two kids. Um, so, uh, that's, that's probably, you know, probably my most unexpected, uh, you know, possibility type of story. Oh, I love both of those. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys. Um, so I wanted to know, I don't know if you can discuss this or not, what next projects you have, um, both in the pipeline. Colin, I'm going to circle back really quickly um, regarding your bread making skills. Will you put putting the recipe and how to on Instagram so we can um, try to make it at home as well? I'll, I'll have to see. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll put it up there. Put a photograph, but it's uh, it's very tasty. It's very nice. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, um, oh, in the uh, the question was in the what's in the pipeline next? Um, it, it's yes. funny. There's a bunch of things I'm working on that I can't talk about in terms of what I can. Um, I am, I'm working on, uh, three comic book, uh, adaptations, uh, ironically for features. Um, one is, uh, Jackpot for Sony. She's a Spider-Man character, uh, that I actually co-created back when I was writing Spider-Man for Marvel. Uh, the second is, uh, a movie called Profit, uh, a, and that's a character from the creator of Deadpool. And the third is uh, based on a, it, it exists as an anime and a manga uh, comic called Gantz. And ironically, I became a fan of Gantz when I was working on Three Below, uh, when Guillermo and I were uh, developing that show, um, he said, you have to check out this, this anime called Gantz. And I totally loved it. And the idea that, you know, a few years later I'm adapting it as a movie is crazy to me. Uh, it's just one of those funny, you know, things the way life works out. Uh, my Thank next, you. I, yes. I have, um, a show coming out uh, on Disney Plus called The Right Stuff. Uh, so it's based on the Tom Wolfe uh, book about the Mercury Seven astronauts and the, the beginnings of NASA. So I play uh, Gordo Cooper, who was the um, the last of the Mercury Seven uh, astronauts to go up. So that's uh, I'm. I'm not, it's sometime in the fall. It's coming out. Thank you.